This is Twist. This Week in Science, episode number 778, recorded on Wednesday, June 17th, 2020. How to find a lizard. Hi there, I'm Dr. Kiki, and tonight on This Week in Science, we will fill your head with bubbles, Santa, and lizards. But first... Thanks to the Burroughs Welcome Fund and our Patreon sponsors for their generous support of Twists. You can become a part of the Patreon community at patreon.com slash thisweekinscience. Disclaimer, disclaimer, disclaimer. With keen eyes and quick reflexes, you might just be able to find and catch that lizard in your garden. Be gentle enough and maybe, just maybe, it won't drop its tail. But if it does, you haven't failed. You've seen the magic of biology as generations of adaptations and evolution have led it to a survival strategy that works more often than not, we hope. Just like weeding through that podcast directory has brought you to This Week in Science. Coming up next. I've got the kind of mind that can't get enough. I want to learn everything. I want to fill it all up with new discoveries that happen every day of the week. There's only one place to go to find the knowledge I seek. I want to know. Good science to you, and welcome everyone to this episode of This Week in Science. Thank you for joining us. We have a great show ahead, and on this week's show, we have tons of science news and an interview. I have stories about sponges for COVID. Wait, what? Sponges? I don't know about that. Bubbles and Santa. And if you hadn't noticed yet, Justin and Blair are out sick tonight, and unfortunately, we're going to miss them. I hope they get their needed rest and that they are able to get back in the game, on the show, next week, you know, for the the usual twist banter. Make sure all of you out there send them a get well tweet or an email. Tell them you miss them. But in the meantime, we have gained a guest host, Aaron McGee. Aaron is a PhD candidate at the University of Arizona and also an AAAS, the American Association for the Advancement of Science, if then ambassador, and also a AAAS mass media fellow. And she loves lizards. She's a herpetologist on a mission. Get people to love lizards. Oh, thank you for joining the show tonight. Thank you for having me. Super excited. And yeah, definitely caught me a little off guard here, but you know, we're going to have your, we're going to have a good time. If that opening, that opening was, you know, got getting everything ready for what this night is going to be about. And so it's going to be a lot of fun. I'm excited to have you here. We met at the AAAS annual meeting this year, and it was yeah. wonderful to get to meet you in person because I've been following your Twitter account for, for quite a while with your hashtag find that lizard, which we'll, we will talk about in a little bit. Right. Yeah. But did you bring a show for the story tonight? I did. So we're going to talk a little bit about lizards and their reactions to the clothes that people wear. All right. I didn't think that lizards were interested in fashion, but we will find out more about that in just a little bit. As we all jump into the show here, I want to remind you that if you haven't subscribed to the Twist podcast yet, it's a great place to get your weekly science, and you can find us on just about every podcast platform that's out there, also on YouTube and Facebook. Look for This Week in Science or Twist, T-W-I-S. You can visit our website, twist.org, for more information. But now let's move into the science and dive headfirst into our weekly COVID update, which, you know, that's always fun. (laughs) Yeah. Yes. Weird definition of fun there. (laughs) I I find strange things fun, true. 
No, it's uh, it is an ongoing pandemic that we are all having to deal with around the globe. Um, but in particular, let's talk about what is happening in the United States and also what is happening when it comes to some of the drugs and the science that is out there. Currently, we are looking at COVID-19 numbers starting to go back up a bit. There's been a waning uh, for a, a little while. We started to open back up. The lockdowns and social distancing were reduced, and a lot of places kind of jumped back into it a little bit too quickly, perhaps. And so currently, globally, COVID-19 cases are over 8 million individuals confirmed, diagnosed, with nearly 450,000 deaths globally, of which the U.S.'s contribution is about a quarter, wow. about 25% of that 450,000 just here in the United States. So if we can, let's continue to maintain the non-pharmaceutical interventions to preserve health. We know that wearing masks reduces the spread of these viral particles. So does social distancing, which is if you're going to stand and talk to somebody, maybe talk with them six, 12 feet apart. You can stand at, you know, one end of, of your car, each of you at the other end of the car or, you know, whatever you find works for you. Use also proper hygiene. There was a lot of talk this week about um, flushing toilets and COVID on Twitter. Did you see any of those stories, Erin? I did. I did come across that. And I was just like, well, I'm glad that I put the toilet seat down before <laughs> I flush every time and clean my bathroom regularly because that is horrific. <laughs> and it's not just a COVID issue. So we've, we have viruses. Norovirus is one of the mm -hmm. big ones that is a huge issue. And we know that flushing the toilet, it vaporizes a lot of water. There's lots of droplets that end up in the air and they float around in the air in your bathroom. So if you have a lid, put it down. Clean your bathroom as often as you can. Practice good hygiene. These are things that will protect you and your family, not just from COVID, from, but from lots of viruses. And when we, when we continue down that road of, you know, where else are there toilets, maybe minimize your time in public restrooms uh, where there are no lids to put down when you flush, or if you are unable to do that, make sure that you're not going into the bathroom, maybe where there's a line for the bathroom or with multiple people. You don't need to have the party bathroom. Right. And maybe some places could start thinking about like retrofitting their, um, their bathrooms. Cause like one of the things that I hate is like when I'm in the airport and I have like all my stuff with me and like, you can't yeah. just like leave it sitting out somewhere. And I'm like in the bathroom and I'm just like, yeah. okay, I got to hurry up and, and do what I got to do. Because as soon as I stand up, this thing is going to automatically flush on me and the things are going to be on me and I don't want them. And I, <laughs> and it causes me so much stress. And I'm just like, how can I be fast about this while also, also pulling all of my stuff from outside of this bathroom and getting out the door? So much stress. I I am right there with you. And if anyone has an answer for that out there, I mean, I'd love to hear how you navigate the awkward bathroom with your luggage and trying to stay trying to stay as clean as possible. Yeah. Oh my goodness. Um. So moving away from bathrooms, let's talk about some of the treatments that are out there right now. This all this last week also a press release came out of the UK about a study looking at a drug called dexamethasone. And dexamethasone is a steroid. It has been used for years to treat inflammation, which many steroids are used to do. And doctors are already using it to one degree or another to treat patients who are on ventilators who, are, who have COVID-19 to reduce the inflammation that may be caused simply by the ventilators themselves. But this was a fairly large study, and the statistics that were released through the press release suggested that it's very promising and can is the first drug, really, that uh, has the potential to actually save lives. Not, it's, it's not going to save everyone's lives, but approximately one out of every eight people who is so ill with COVID-19 that they end up on a ventilator 
will be saved by the use of dexamethasone, according to this research. So like, I have a question. So yes. like, so I would assume like there's different stages of being on the ventilator where like you're in like super like respiratory failure versus like it's not quite that bad. So did the study say anything about that as far as um, how effective the drug would be? It wasn't broken down that rigorously in this mm. because what we're looking at, like I said, it was a press release. So right. they, were, uh, they got to the stage in this clinical study where the control group that did not receive dexamethasone was dying significantly more often, mm. uh, or at least statistically significant, significantly more often than the group that was receiving the dexamethasone. Right. Um, and so ethically, they said, we have to give everybody the drug because we have to offer, we, we have to hope that it will help more people. Right. So they weren't so they they found a level of significance that suggested to them it's useful. However, we have not yet seen a peer-reviewed study. The mm. data hasn't been released to the public yet. So we don't know anymore. We do know right. that um it's not useful or it doesn't seem to be very useful on people in early stages of the disease. Mm. So if you are asymptomatic, pre-symptomatic, you're just slightly ill not having to go into the hospital, you don't need it. It's not going right. to help you. <laughs> well, that's really weird yeah. because it's because like typically, well, a lot of the times it's either you have the disease or you don't have it, not you have to have it to a certain degree. So the fact yeah. that it doesn't work if you are just in the beginning stages, you have to go through a certain point. That's really interesting. Yeah, and people are saying they think it might actually be it's that it's reducing the inflammation that comes from that artificial ventilation itself. Mm -hmm. And maybe it is some aspect of that very late, only in that very late stage with some people who have a particular immune response and inflammation response. So, you know, this week, was it, it's promising, but it's not the treatment that's going to save everyone. Um, yeah. So don't rush out and hoard dexamethasone. <laughs> <laughs> right. We don't want you doing that. Um, like people who ran out to hoard hydroxychloroquine, which was the drug that is, is a malaria drug that was touted by uh, the Trump administration. And in fact, our in the months that have that we've that we've gone through since that announcement was made that hydroxychloroquine is promising and we should use it to treat people. More data has come out that actually, no, it's not. And there are some big studies that have been totally shut down. The World Health Organization just stopped a study that involved hydroxychloroquine because they did not see a benefit. So right. they're like, we're just not even going to do this study anymore because we aren't seeing anything. So it's, and it's probably hurting people more often than it's helping mm. them. And the FDA just this last week revoked its emergency approval of the oh, drug wow. for treating COVID-19. So this week has been a kind of a, this odd week. Hydroxychloroquine is out. Dexamethasone is in. And I, I think also I saw, a, I, I saw an article saying that the United States government had um, pulled its weight to gather a large stockpile of hydroxychloroquine. So... Wow. So now we have it or we are gathering it at the moment. We've probably paid for it and are, and are getting it. So it'll be useful when malaria becomes a problem in the southern United States. Isn't it also used for like lupus and stuff other? Yes. So yeah. like for all the people who weren't able to get their medication because of, you know, yes. the hysteria, it would be great if, you know, hand out a couple of boxes for free for the people who are made to you know suffer for for no reason essentially it's like make sure that they're good for the next six months to a year i'm with you i think that would be great <laughs> can we make that happen right oh my gosh and then uh my final covid story i wanted to get away from uh these kind of political drug stories and into into what i thought was a an interesting um possible treatment well or a possible prevention. And this particular story, it could, it 
could help with a lot of diseases, which is really hopeful. So these researchers at UC San Diego are working on what they call nanosponges. And these, these nanosponges are a, uh, a polymer tube core. And so it's, it's not like a sponge in the sense of what you put on your kitchen counter, but in the sense of the mechanical absorption or it, the way that it can grab things that it attracts, attracts things. This polymer has around the outside of it, it's been seeded with particles or figments of epithelial lung cells. They've also covered these, these polymer cores with little bits of macrophages. And so we've got these epithelial cells, which SARS-CoV-2, the virus that causes COVID-19, likes to bind to and likes to infect. And the macrophages are these immune cells which like to attack the virus. They've tested this in mice in what they do is they aspirate or they, they put these little tiny nanoparticles that are basically, they become competitors for the virus's attention. Wow. So where the virus would normally go into the lung and bind to the lung epithelial cells. Instead, there's a whole bunch of these little sponges in there, and they're like going, hey, I'm a lung cell too. And the virus goes, I can't tell the difference, but since there's so much competition, they are more likely to get grabbed by the sponges. It's a really neat thing. They were able to make it so that the virus lost about 90% of its viral infectivity, became 93% less infectious using these nano sponges with the, uh, with the lung material on them. And there was about 88% reduction in infectivity with the macrophage parts on them. And they've tested this before with, uh, with HIV. They've tested it with with MERS, they've tested it with different kinds of microbes as well. And basically the idea is that, and, and what I'm imagining it as, is in the future, if this were to become a treatment that works in people, they showed that it works in mice, so now we still have a long way to go. But I can imagine if you are an immune compromised person or someone who has a potential, like a, 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 potential, a potential medical disability that will predispose you to becoming infected, by COVID, then you might have a little asthma inhaler that has these nano sponges in it. And if you know you're going into a public environment, going outside somewhere where you're going to be around people, you can take a little, little puff of the nano sponges, they'll be in your lung, and then you can go out and interact, you know, still wear your mask and take precautions. But if you do get exposed to any of the virus, it, it's more likely that the nanosponges would grab onto it. And then because the nanosponges are in there, your body's own immune system will then break down, grab onto and break down the nanosponges and just get rid of them. Wow. So it's kind of just like allergy medicine for COVID. Exactly. <laughs> yeah. I mean, at this point, you know, we don't know, speaking of allergies, you know, who knows what these little nanoparticles how right. they will interact with the human lung. It's a great idea. And I love the idea of being able to take something prophylactically. They've also, mm -hmm. they're also talking about with, with some diseases, and this could possibly work with people who are um, already, who already have COVID and are, have advanced to hospitalization that perhaps um, in the ventilator, they they have some of these nano these nano sponges in the air that you're breathing, and maybe that can help to reduce the viral load in your lungs. Maybe it can right. compete with what's in your body, or you know, maybe they can even um, inject some of these particles into your bloodstream if it's something that you want to grab out of the blood. Yeah, it will be interesting to see how people's bodies like accept or reject yeah. those particles, because then it becomes a thing of you know, how, how much of a dosage do you have to give to account for people's bodies potentially, you know, being like, oh, we need to get this out right now. Yeah. <laughs> mm -hmm. 
<laughs> I am just going to cough it up. At right. This point. Yeah. Um, but it's a really, I think it's a really interesting idea. And I love the, it, it's a novel approach to addressing viruses and these, right. these diseases. Um, and the researchers are really, you know, they, they've been working on this platform for probably about a decade, but, um, mm -hmm. and they said, oh, let's test it with SARS and it works really well. So the big question is, can they, uh, can they actually get it to work in the human right. body? Can they make it, can they make it safe? Well, this is a totally new virus doing something completely wild. So maybe a really wild idea is what's going to, what it's going to take to, to beat it. Yeah. I'm all for wild ideas. I like it. Try it all yeah. out. <laughs> throw, like throw the spaghetti at the wall, see what sticks, right? Right. <laughs> all right. I have finished my COVID news, everyone. And I'm, I'm sitting here and I'm speaking with Erin. And I introduced her just a little bit, but I am sure so many of you right now are going, I don't know Erin. Who's Erin? So first off, lizards. Yes. Where did your love of lizards come from? When I was an undergraduate student at Howard University, uh, the person's lab who I ended up working with in, uh, George Middendorf, he was a herpetologist. He studied lizards. And so then I got to go out to the Chiricahua Mountains and do some field research. And that was really like my first field experience. And I was like, yeah, this is for me. I love this. And so I never like the way I see it is that lizards picked me. I didn't really pick lizards because as a kid, I was like, <laughs> I want to work with elephants. I want to work with wolves or foxes or something cool like that. Lizards were nowhere on my radar. I did not think about lizards at all. But then I got the opportunity to work with them and I was like, oh, they, they're all right. They're kind of decent. Yeah. So, 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 so you were into animals. Yeah. I was super age. into animals and it was the bane of my mom's existence because I would be like, look, mom, I found a snake or look, mom, I caught this lizard or mom, I see a rabbit over there and I'm going to go chase it. And or like <laughs> one time, <laughs> one time uh, we went to D.C. and we were going to the Lincoln Memorial. I was like, a, I was real young. I had to be in like maybe middle school or something. And I was like, mom, I'm going to go climb the tree. And she kept being like, no, don't do that. What is wrong with you? And I was like, mom. I'm a tree climber. I do this. And so I go and I try to climb this tree. I slide down, bump my head on the branch. And I'm like, you know what? It's fine. Whatever. I'm going to keep going. I look up and it's like a spider the size of my head. Like, like just right. And I'm just like, what do I do? It's going to eat my face. <laughs> and then I just like start because crying. that's what spiders do, right? Right. But I was, I was a kid and I, you know, yeah. like, I, yeah, I was I was a kid. I didn't. My brain wasn't putting things together correctly, and my mom was just like, "That's what you get. <laughs> That's what you get for climbing the trees." Yeah, I told you not to do it. I don't know. I yeah. think as kids, we have to go. Kids have to look at their parents. You, as a parent, you give the advice, and the kids just sometimes got to do what they have to do to learn. Right. right. Yeah, I did. I don't I don't think I climbed a tree for a really long time after that. <laughs> mostly because bad. I was <laughs> mostly because I was like terrified of, of spiders as a kid. But when I had to start doing research and field work, it was one of those things where it's like, no matter what you do, there's always a spider on you. You might not see it, but it's probably there. And so I just kind of had to like get used to it. And so now, now when I see a spider, I'm not afraid of it. I'm like, I can actually like appreciate it. Like people like post pictures of like the little jumping spiders. And I'm like, oh, those are actually really cute. I love the jumping spiders. Yeah. And the, the spider dances. I'm not a big fan of the, the really poisonous ones, but right. That's okay. We're, gotta work up to it. Gotta work up. Yeah. I mean, <laughs> not everyone is like Australia caliber spider. <laughs> right. And the spiders. But with the, the lizards, how did you um how did you start figuring out kind of what questions you're interested in and what, what lizards you want to look at and what specifically what what specifically like do you do you really want to know about them? 
So uh, when I was an undergrad, I was looking at uh, three species of lizards, the Yarrow spiny lizard, the striped plateau lizard, and then the ornate tree lizard. And I was looking at their microhabitat preferences. So I had about um, two years worth of my own data that I collected. And then my undergraduate advisor, he had been going out there for like 40 plus years. So I had used a couple of years of his data. And so um, we kind of like confirmed what was already out in the literature, but then we also like looked at the distance that the lizards moved. So most lizards don't move like more than five meters in their like during like when they're just out and about. Like they might move a long distance if they're um if it's like this like the end of the end of the summer and going or into the fall and they're going into a hibernacula. So like the place where they overwinter and whatnot. So like they might depending on the size of the lizard and the gender or the and the sex of the lizard, it might take a long time to um it might be further away from the hibernacula than some of the others. But in general, they don't really move more than like five meters. And so that was really cool. And so I knew that I wanted to stick with natural history questions like that. Um, and then my credit advisor, Michael Bogan, he is an aquatic entomologist. And so um, my undergraduate advisor was just like, you need to go work with Michael. I already worked with him. He's a great guy. That's the person who you're going to work with. And then me... At the time I had like this boyfriend and I was like, well, I don't want to leave him and I want to be like somewhere close. I can't go all the way to Arizona. Right. And then me and Michael like kind of like sat down and started like talking and he was just like, listen, if lizards are your jam, that's cool. But just figure out how you can mix lizards with aquatic insects. And so that's Hmm. kind of where the birth of my study question, because like me and him, we like, like, we kind of just like meshed. I was just like, like, it was just like, and I was like, okay, I got. I guess I'm going there. to Arizona. Yeah, yeah, I'm, I'm going there. Like nobody else who I talked to, like, I was really like quite as like instantly comfortable with. So I was just like, nice. okay, this guy is going to have my back. He's really going to help me like evolve as the scientist in the ways that I want to. And so mm-hmm. I'm going to go work with him. So that's kind of where my study questions came from. So I'm really interested in lizard diet so like what are lizards eating and so like if I asked you that what would you say if I asked you what do lizards eat they eat bugs right but what kind of bugs (laughs) moths because I've seen videos of them eating moths and butterflies they and where and where do those (laughs) moths and moths um and flies come from oh yeah Oh, they come from aquatic environment. Maybe, maybe we Where do we they don't come from. That we, that's what I that's what I'm hoping to figure out. So there's been a couple of papers that look at um, lizard diets and where those insects come from, but there hasn't been like a whole lot of that. So there's been a lot of lizard diet papers, but they've been like a lot of like gut pumping and stuff like that. So they're just like, okay, we have a piece of a moth's wing here. So this is a moth. And there's like, this looks like a fly. Like, so no one's done like that real deep analysis to look at, are these insects, are any of these insects that they're eating aquatic and like how important is aquatic species? And that's really important information to know because, um, In the southwestern United States, we're having like a lot of climate change and a lot of drought and it's getting a lot hotter. And so the streams are drying up. And so if there are no streams, that means that the aquatic insects won't have any place to spend their larval stage. And so then they can't emerge from the larval stage to the adult stage and then live in the terrestrial um, area and then be food for a whole bunch of animals. So like Lizards are my particular study species. I love them, but um, they're like birds eat aquatic insects. You have like small mammals will eat aquatic insects. So like there's a bats will eat aquatic insects. Like there's a whole bunch of stuff that do eat these aquatic insects. So aquatic insects are an important like food source to a lot of animals, but those um, aquatic to terrestrial like 
things moving from the aquatic system to the terrestrial system, and not a whole lot of studies haven't been done on that. A lot of studies been done on the reverse, so terrestrial stuff falling into water and then becoming food for various aquatic, aquatic things. Yeah. yeah. So those studies have been done. So we need to do it in the reverse. So uh, for my study, I go out into the Chiricahua Mountains because when I was an undergrad, I just fell in love and I was like, well, I'm going to do my grad work here because it is fabulous and I love it. And these lizards are awesome. So I typically spend um, five weeks or two months or so in the mountains. And every day is lizard catching day with maybe a break here or there. But it's like you wake up, you eat some breakfast, you go out and you catch some lizards. And my rule (laughs) is see a lizard, catch a lizard. That is like, do not let that thing get away. If the lizard is like running, you need to be running behind it to catch it. Oh my gosh. (laughs) (laughs) Or if it's like, if the lizard is giving you trouble, like call for somebody so you can like tag team it. Cause like sometimes it it takes more than one person to catch a lizard. So I think um, that's a, that's a motto right there. It takes more than one person to catch a lizard. (laughs) Yeah. The field experience I have is in catching birds. And so Mm -hmm. we had mist nets, we had food traps, we had very specific ways to be able to catch the birds. And I I did not have to run after them. (laughs) (laughs) But so, so, and I, and I know many children have grown up with pieces of grass that they've Mm -hmm. tied into a little, a little loop, a little harness that they've caught. Yeah. Ice lizards or, you know, skinks catching mm-hmm. the, blue, the, the blue-bellied skinks with the little nooses. But I'm imagining you have more refined methods. Oh, yes. Yeah. So, you, so fancy. So I actually awesome. have a lizard lasso with me. So you have, a, you use lizard lassos? Yes. Okay. There's so, a little lasso at the end. Yeah. So it's a piece of thin thread is what kind of thread is that so this is actually braided surgical silk you can't get this like in the spools anymore so my advisor like bought it in bulk at some Mm -hmm. point and then he like gave me some and so so now this is very special it is it is very (laughs) special I've had this lasso for like the entirety of my graduate career so I've had this for like four years what this yeah what size like I'm I, I mean braided surgical silk is going to be really strong silk for mm-hmm. one is strong braided is, is going to increase its strength and its durability but I mean what size lizards can you catch with this silk so that it's you know the lizard isn't too big and breaks the string lizards get to be about 12 ish centimeters like they they can get pretty big they can they can be pretty big bodies so they're, they're not like super huge. They're more like small to medium sized lizards. You definitely cannot catch large lizards with this. It just, it would break. And then yeah. uh, it helps if they are like spiny lizards. So where the spines overlap, because if they're smooth, like skinks or um, whiptails, it becomes a lot more difficult and they could just like easily like slide out. Yeah. And so I yeah. am proud to say that I have uh, lassoed whiptails on multiple occasions <laughs> because it is <laughs> it is quite quite the feat. So, yes. yeah. So so, you, so do you, you do you find the lizard and then try and stalk them and and place the lasso exactly. in a, a, a location that they might run into it or. No. So work? like. You have to like adjust um, the size of the lasso depending on the species of lizard or the um, size of the lizard. So you'll have a lizard and then some lizards. So lizards have different personalities and you'll find that out as soon as you like start to approach the lizard. Either it's going to try to like run away or it's just going to sit there and let you let you come up to it. So some lizards will be like like you'll bring the lasso to it. And it'll just sit there and let you get it around its head or like it'll see, fill it. And then it'll like start whipping it around. And it's cause it's like, thinks it's a a spider's net or something, spider's web. Or they'll see like the little, um, there's like the little knot right here. They'll think that that's like a fly and there's a, and that it's food. So they'll try to eat it and then they'll like (laughs) collapse your lasso. And then there's other lizards 
um, like tree lizards that will bask on like rocks at the base of trees. And then as soon as they see you coming, they'll like dart up the tree. And so the great thing about um, this is this particular lasso, um, this rod is that it's telescopic. So it can, uh, you can lengthen it how, um, however long that it goes. So this one is, it used to be 6.6 meters, but I broke, broke off a pump. All right, so now it's a little bit shorter than that. <laughs> it's gotten some good use. Yeah, it has. Um, so then uh, you'll have to like, like reach up. And so like something that you can do really is, so with the different segments, um, or I guess with the, the longest segment that's out there, you can use that to like herd the lizard. So if like a lizard is trying to go up, you can like herd it back down. So it'll, it'll see it, this come above it and they'll turn around and go down. You hope. Mm -hmm. Sometimes it mm -hmm. might like go around the tree and then you're like, really lizard? Are you really going to be this difficult today? If those are the games you want to play, we can do that. But let's not. <laughs> Where do you find lizards? Like you said, some of them bask in the sun under mm -hmm. on, on, on a rock. Um, I know fen fence lizards like to sit on fences. Um, but are the do you go? I remember. Uh, do you go go turn over pieces of wood to go searching for your lizards, or are they usually out in the open? So my lizards are typically more out in the open. So they like to like bask on the rocks or fallen logs and things like that. Um, it really does depend on the species for like um, tree lizards and like Clark spiny lizards. They definitely stay on the rocks close to trees. And then as soon as they hear you coming, they'll dart up the tree. For Yarrow spiny lizard, I mostly find them on like rock outcrop. So like um, like if it's like a like a wall type thing and it has a bunch of rocks, you'll see them on there. You'll see them on like different boulders and stuff like that. With uh, the striped plateau lizard, they like to like dig. And so you'll see them on the ground. Uh, Whiptail lizards also like to dig through like the leaf litter. So like the, the leaves that fall off the trees onto the ground because that's where they find a lot of their food. And then with alligator lizards, they're really cool because um, they 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 look like what they're named after. They kind of like look like these itty bitty alligators. And so they kind of almost swim through leaf litter and they kind of like try to like find their food. So like they'll go like like really slow and some and like they'll have their like legs like really close to their bodies and like their back legs will be like like in line with their body and they're kind of like swim through. And so like a lot of times people might think that they're snakes, but they're not, they're lizards. And they're right. just like really doing snake-like movements to confuse people and predators. That's interesting. Is there a lot of that uh, mimicry or that, yeah, I guess that that would be mimicry. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So I'm not sure how how much of that there is in lizards in general. Yeah. And that would be another interesting question. Right. <laughs> the, you mentioned before the microhabitats that you're looking at and how the, the lizards are kind of choosing these different, trying to figure out how the lizards choose the microhabitats. And so, I mean, I'm imagining, you know, as, a, as an analogy, and let me know if this is accurate or not, but, you know, I live in Portland. And there are different neighborhoods in Portland. And, you know, five meters to me might be like my city block mm -hmm. to a lizard. So is that like the, the block of houses and area um, and those all the stuff that's in that? Is that would that kind of be the a similar scale or would it be kind of like, oh, we've got the downtown neighborhood and these lizards who hang out downtown, they're a bit, they're a bit tougher. They like to hang out in the financial district. Yeah. <laughs> um, I, you know, that's a good way of thinking about it that I never really thought about it before. Um, I don't, I, I never really looked to see if there was any like personality difference based on where the lizards were living at. So I can't really say, I don't know. Someone in the chat room had um, brought up, you, you mentioned the word hibernaculum. And so is, I mean, this isn't like a vampire's cave, <laughs> but can you describe a lizard's hibernaculum for me? 
I mean, it's kind of like a vampire's cave when you think about like with all the bats flying out from where they roost at. It's kind of like the same thing for lizards, except for they only go there to overwinter. So it's like a like a bunch of lizards within the area are going to go into like this. So it could be like like you have like this giant rock wall or something like there's some crevice in there so they can go in so deep. And then that will be a decent temperature for them throughout the the winter and they'll all just hang out there for the most part or it might be something where they kind of go underground and hang out there so it's really just like where a bunch of lizards overwinter together so so they go there together and well they, they might not go like together but like they'll but they they, end up there they end up together yeah right that's fascinating i yeah i just have i've always imagined lizards just kind of digging into the dirt and ending up other underground or actually I act I actually to be honest I don't think I've ever considered where lizards go in the winter time yeah I mean some lizards do just dig underground and they'll like be by themselves like kilo monsters they do that they have the, these nice burrows that they spend pretty much like 90 percent of their lives in and someone in our YouTube chat room was asking if lizard diets change with the seasons. I mean, while they're hibernating, they're not eating anything. But in the other seasons, do do you know if their diets change? Yes. So, well, yes-ish. So, well, I guess like mostly yes. Because it's for the aquatic insect parts, that is uh, controlled a lot by the seasons. So a lot of insects will emerge from the stream system based on um, what's going on with the weather. So like in Arizona, we have monsoon season. And so a lot of uh, aquatic insects are programmed to emerge before the monsoons because the rains will flood the stream and scorch it and pretty much kill everything that's um, in there that's that tiny. Um, and then like in some uh, times when there's not a whole lot of like abundance of like different types of insects. So really like pre-monsoon season, a lot of lizards will end up uh, eating ants. Because huh. those are pretty much always abundant. <laughs> Recently, you were you, you you work a lot, not just recently, but you you do a lot of work in science communications. Mm -hmm. You started the find that lizard hashtag on Twitter, which you did today. You do every Wednesday. Yes. Uh, how did how did you get started doing that? That Twitter effort and, you know, why why do you, why are you interested in science communication? So I started on Twitter when I started grad school four years ago because my advisor Michael was like super into Twitter and sharing science and stuff on Twitter and he was like yeah I know this person from Twitter and that person from Twitter and I collaborated from with this person who I met on Twitter and I was like all right it sounds like I need to get me a Twitter so that way I could be more involved with yeah. um, the scientific community and so I was just like I hope that if people know me from Twitter maybe they'll give me a job after I graduate because I'm one of those people who like think like 10 years in advance at all times. And so I was like, let me just go ahead and hop on here. And so then I just kind of like started tweeting about the stuff that I knew or that I was doing. And it was one of those things where I was just like, hmm, this is kind of fun. I'm actually like enjoying this. I'm enjoying having like conversations with people. And then I just kept doing it. And so, and uh what year was it? In 2018, I was doing field work and I needed to recapture this lizard. And I desperately needed to recapture her because in this particular site, it was like really lacking lizards. So if I can get another data point, that would have been great. And so like, I'm literally chasing her around my study site because she will not give up. And so yes. I'm just like lizard, oh my goodness. And so like, I come to a point where I think that I lost a lizard and I'm looking around and I'm not seeing the lizard. And then finally, like I look over my shoulder and there she is on a tree looking at me, trying to see if I see her. And I'm like, yes, I see, see me, lizard. And so <laughs> because, because I had already caught her, uh, she had a paint mark on her back. And so it was the number five and a bright orange paint. And so I was like, yes, I see you. And that was the, the paint mark was the only reason I saw her. If she didn't have that paint mark, she would have been gone. 
And so I took a picture before I went and caught her and I did catch her. I did get my extra data point. <laughs> and um, I posted it to Twitter and I and I told people, I was like, yeah, this is what happened. And this lizard was like, I wouldn't have seen her if it wasn't for this paint mark. And people were like, what lizard? What are you talking about? I don't see a lizard in this picture. And I'm just like, you don't how, see the how lizard? do you not see this? It's right there. <laughs> and so um, people were just like, yeah, this is fun. And they they were like, you should keep doing this. And so I was like, well, I guess I'll post a picture. And now I have to start thinking about interesting things to post a um, with the picture and so I had also started taking like some science communication classes and so I was just like how is a way that I can frame this information so that like anybody who reads it can understand it whether you know they're like six or like 66 or whatever like I wanted to make sure that everybody was able to like learn something new and have fun doing it and so then I just I just started being consistent and I just kept doing it every week pretty much and and then it just took on a life of its own and grew from there. How much interaction do you get from people? What what kinds of interactions do you get from people? Um, so nowadays I get a lot of interactions. When I first started, I didn't really get that many. But I love the Find That Lizard community because they are so funny. They are hilarious. And and people are just like telling me like stories about like lizards that they've encountered or the ones that they see in their backyards and stuff. And people get like excited about like finding the lizard because like it's one of those things where like if I tell you about it, you're like, that's goofy. I don't even know why somebody would do that. And then like <laughs> like people have been like, what what is wrong with you? Give me your phone so I can see it. And I'm going to find the lizard. And then they're like right. sitting there for like five minutes, like looking for the lizard. And I'm just like, mm-hmm, mm-hmm. And they're like, I'm like, can I have my phone back? And they're like, no, I have to find it first. And I was like, oh, okay. <laughs> All right. <laughs> and so like it ends up being one of those things where it's like you you feel a type of way if you can't find it. And so like it like kind yeah. of bruises your ego a little bit if you can't find the lizard in the picture. And so it gets people like really engaged. and. Um, People talk about if they found it or not, or if they had to cheat and look through the comments. And it's just a great way to like talk to people about lizards and stuff. So um, it's pretty fun. There have been times when I've posted a picture and like I was so focused on the lizard that was my subject that I didn't notice like another lizard had photobombed and people are like, hey, there's another lizard in this there's photo. And I'm like, no, there's yeah. not. Like it was like a period of like a couple of months where like this one person would just be like, yeah, I found another lizard in the photo. And I'd be like, gosh, darn it. And I'd be like, and sometimes I'd be like, yeah, you did. And other times I'd be like, no, you're just, you just want there to be another one. There's not another one here. <laughs> yeah. Someone, uh, Fada in the chat room is saying it's like the where's Waldo of, of lizards. Yeah. <laughs> and you find them in there. Yeah, it's a one I, I love it, though, as a as a tool for, like you said, being able to talk to people about lizards and educate people about where you find lizards, different types of lizards, why you, you know, all sorts. Exactly. Of, yeah, it's a great. And, and I end up tool. learning a lot, too, because I'm like, OK, because like sometimes it's one of those things where it's like most I take about, you know, 90 to, to like I take I take the vast majority of the photos myself. So it's like whatever li lizards I can find locally. So sometimes it's like repeat species. And I'm like, all right, I got to go find some fresh information. What is something that I don't know about this lizard that I think will be really cool to know about this lizard? And so then I end up doing like some deep dives <laughs> on that species, trying to figure out what is something interesting that other people might think it's interesting that I haven't already talked about. That's fantastic. Yeah, this is this is great. I have been looking at sometimes I am able to find your lizards and sometimes I'm not. <laughs> There's an image uh that's up on the screen for those of you who are watching the video right now. I don't I don't know where that lizard is. <laughs> Listen, when I was taking the photo, like I had the camera up and I kept have to keep being like is the lizard still there? Yeah, it is. Okay, it let is. me let me find it in the viewfinder. I can't see it. It's and I kept being like because I couldn't find the lizard myself while I was there in person. So yeah. if you like, if you struggle, it's it's okay. I did too. All right. All right. So everyone, if you're interested, you can follow the hashtag, find that, find that lizard on Twitter. And Erin, what's your, um, your Twitter account handle? 
It's Afro underscore Herper, H-E-R-P-E-R. Awesome. Um, another aspect of your your science communication last last was it last week last, or now days are running together <laughs> yeah. apologize. but you were um one of the people responsible for the um the black birders week yes that was amazing um can you talk a little bit about what brought you to 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 get that started and you know how you organized it and you know, some of the things that came out of it. So shout out to Jason Ward. Um, he's kind of like the guy who brought us all together and kind of started the um, Black AF and STEM group. And so we had been in that group and talking and getting to know each other for, you know, a long time, over a year. And um, we're, we all kind of like we're watching like the Christian Cooper incident in Central Park together. and then. Um, hearing about Ahmaud Aubrey and Breonna Taylor and George Floyd. And, and we were all kind of feeling um, upset because it was just like, though any of those people could have easily been us. And we don't see enough of our peers and the scientific community and academia uh, talking about this violence against Black people. And, and, and we were like, a part of that reason is because like, they don't they don't really realize that we're there um hmm. and how many of us are there so we were just like you know it's time to do a roll call type thing so we started the week out with um black in nature and that was just about uh promoting anybody that it likes being outdoors that um that identifies as a black person african american whoever like it was about uplifting them increasing the representation, being like, yeah, we might be spread out. We might not all be in one department, like 50 deep in one department or something, but there's still a lot of us and we, we are here. And so we wanted everybody to feel included because a lot of the people who have, were helping to organize Black Birders Week, like myself, are not um, technically birders. Like now I'll call myself like a baby birder because like <laughs> they really got me into it. But like, I wasn't really a birder going going into it. So we wanted to make sure that we included um, everybody. Yeah. And um, so we were doing all these fun activities, post a bird um, and post your favorite bird fact. And I did, instead of doing hashtag find that lizard, I did find that bird. Um, we had a couple of live streams on Facebook. We had some on um, Instagram where we were all just kind of like hanging out. Um, the Facebook ones had Christian Cooper and um, Drew Lanham, uh, who was another prominent birder in New York. Um, and then we had like a follow Friday where we were talking about, you know, a lot of the times black women and members of the LGBTQ plus community are often overlooked because of their um, sex and gender. And so we were just like, well, we need to also make sure that we are specifically uplifting these people as well. And so we ended up getting a lot of media attention, which, which was great. And we also got the attention of our peers in academia and science and wildlife, you know, people who are working in, you know, different government or um, NGO agencies and stuff where we're just like, listen, you guys are always talking about how you want to do diversity, equity, and inclusion stuff, but you have to, if you're going to do that, you have to embrace all of the parts of what it, of the Black experience, and part of that Black experience is, is um, experiencing, you know, police brutality and anti-Black racism, like, that is a part of it, and you can't ignore that part if you want to bring people um, into the community, you need to be able to um, really understand who uh, who people are, and and also you need to know that we are here. So like when you start like looking for a diverse candidates to hire, like you 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 know that we're out here now. There's no other excuse. Like in order to like build community, you need to bring those people in there and change your and the environment. And so it's, it was one of those things where it's like, you need to recognize like how society treats black people and how 
you being a part of society, you bring that into science and how to stop doing that. And also Mm -hmm. speaking of um, uh, uh, like hiring black people, shout out to Danielle Bellany, who's commenting in Facebook. She's uh, looking for a job right now. She's an awesome, awesome um, ecologist. And she has worked with a bunch of different uh, uh, animals, mammals, birds, you name it, she can do it. Um, but yeah, so it was a it was a great experience in the in the fact that we were all able to come together and and do this really awesome thing in two days. Like like it like we developed this whole week in two days. We started like contacting media outlets like the day before it was supposed to happen and everything and. It was it was just an amazing way to really also get to know like people in the group and stuff. And um, it like right now, things feel like they might be a little bit different. A lot of the times it's like you do advocacy work and. You don't feel like anything's actually come out of it, but I'm really hoping to see some actual change when everybody starts to, you know, go back after COVID, hopefully if when it if it ever ends. So, yeah. Yeah. Within, within science, I mean, I know from going to AAAS conferences for many years now, there more and more, there are panels on diversity, equity, and inclusion. There are, you know, I, I was on a panel on code switching this last, this last year and, um, you know, got to got to moderate some amazing panelists related to that. And I think you're right. I think it is different. I think what's happening now is a wave that is, I mean, hopefully it's still just building and growing and is going to lead someplace really great. Because, And I'm, I mean, the, the fact that, that you're, people like you are working so hard to make change and, um, and, and act, you know, you're doing the activism, you're getting out there, you're seeing an opportunity, you're taking it. I mean, that's the only way that we can, that we can make things different, that we can, that we can change institutions, change society. Yeah. We need to change yeah. society, really. <laughs> Pretty much like that's Society is at the root of, it's part the of the root. root of the issue where it's like, because the way your social upbringing it does affect the way that you interact with people, whether you're a scientist or not. Like a lot of people are just like, yeah, science is so objective and science doesn't bring politics into things. And it's just like, no, you're human. It doesn't matter if you're a scientist, you don't like all of a sudden lose all your upbringing and the ways that you interact with different people just because you start doing science. No, that's not how it works. You bring all your preconceived notions, all your life history, all your lived experiences, and that informs the work that you do. It informs the people that you hire. It informs the people that you see as knowledge holders or people who are credible to give, to add to bodies of knowledge. It it affects everything. I'm just like, I'm going to give you all the snaps right now. (laughs) (laughs) Yeah. Yes. Yes, absolutely. Are you... Uh, are you looking at where you're going to, what you're going to do next? Are there any other plans for, you know, are you going to try and do a Black Birders Week next year? Are there, are, is, are you talking about further activities throughout this year or, you know, just new projects? You know, we have a team meeting tomorrow. Okay. <laughs> and that is when we are going to discuss all of that. We actually got a lot of people asking for us to do like different variations because so many people realized that they weren't alone. Like we got, we got so many comments from people where they were like, you know, I've been doing this job for the last, you know, you know, two, three, four, 10 years. And I really felt like I was the only black person interested in this type of thing. And to be able to see all of these other people coming together and showing themselves like that was super empowering for so many people and so um doing different variations is definitely on our radar black birders week will most likely come back next year i don't want to promise anything just yet because we still have to have our meeting and all but you know go ahead and put it down in calendar 
Awesome. I will do that. Yeah. And I mean, I think you were, you were also speaking to that experience of, um, you know, being an ecologist, a biologist, going out and doing field work. And, um, you know, there, there are, there are experiences that are, you know, more or less likely to happen to you depending on the color of your skin or, you know, your, your gender. And, you know, as, as a woman going out and doing field work, I've sometimes found myself, you know, camping in a remote place with, you know, like one or two men and suddenly finding myself going, do I trust them? Right. Yeah. <laughs> Is that cool? You know, and, but uh, beyond that, there's, you know, there are so many, so many other experiences that, that, you know, people shouldn't even have to think about. Exactly. You, yeah. You, you just want to find your lizard. You don't want to deal with with rotten people. Right. And then it and then it also is like a thing where it's like you are dealing with it when you're in the field and then you're also dealing with it like like when you're actively doing research, but then like when you're still like at these remote areas or you're visiting like these like remote towns and stuff, like you're dealing with it then if you just want to like go out and like get like you know, some souvenirs or something, then it's also one of those things where it's like these people have never really seen black people before. And then they say something or do something super racist. And it's just like, well, my day is now ruined. I'm thanks going to lot. go home. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, pretty much. Hey, thanks for that. I was having a nice time until you yeah. opened your mouth. <laughs> pretty much. And so it's, it's it's one of those constant things. Like you always have to be ready for it it might not be something you're always act like actively thinking about but it's like before you even gone out that day you you have your contingency plan in your mind you're like okay I have all my permits printed out they are taped inside this book this book is going into the bag and then I'm taking the bag with me but yeah so like you definitely have to like already have your plan done in advance where you're just like well if I have these things with me they cannot question my credibility hopefully so yeah but then you also try to like just enjoy the work that you're doing and enjoy nature and so it's like you have it in the back of your mind if it, if need be if you got to pull it out but then when you're actually doing stuff you're just trying to be there in the moment and enjoy it which is what really it's why you're out there exactly yeah to learn about it to enjoy it um I'm going to take us into the second half of our show. Thank you so cool. much for telling me all about your work and um, and talking about your experiences and, and, and the science communication that you're doing and working on growing the, the Black wildlife community, the Black in STEM community, the Black birders, yeah. baby birder. <laughs> <laughs> so everyone, if you just tuned in, this is This Week in Science. You are interested in an item of twist merchandise, a twist face mask, a mug, a shirt, one of the fun things with a twist logo on it, or one of Blair's pieces of original animal art. Head over to twist.org and click on our Zazzle store link. That will take you to our Zazzle store where you can peruse and buy fun twist related items and support This Week in Science. Thank you for listening to Twist. You are the reason that we are able to do what we do every week. You are the reason that we are able to update you on the news, to talk about science, the current events that are going on, and to talk about the world, the society that is that, that encompasses that science, what we do. And with your help, we can do even more. That's right. We can bring a sane perspective to this world full of misinformation with science. And you can help us do that. Head over to twist.org, click on our Patreon link, join our Patreon community, and choose your level of support, $10 a month or more. You will be thanked by name at the end of the show. And you can be a part of bringing sanity and science to more people. Thank you for your support. support. We really couldn't do this without you. We can't 
and explain the things you've heard. And we are back. This is This Week in Science. All right, everybody. I think it's time for some more science news. Hey, Erin, you want to hear about some bubbles? Yes, I love bubbles. Bubbles are like the top uh, stress reliever. So if you're really stressed about something and you need a break, go get you a bottle of bubbles and like literally just start blowing bubbles. And I promise you, (laughs) you will be so much calmer and stress free when you're done. Bubbles? In addition to being a stress reliever and a child entertainer, they are (laughs) also potentially going to be a pollinator. Hmm. Yes, yes. Pollinator. Pollinator. Bubbles, Bubbles. exactly. So honeybees, bumblebees are, are, um, are in decline and it is becoming more and more difficult for, uh, for different, uh, agriculture, different Parts of agriculture for flowers, for uh, trees that need to be pollinated, to find the bees that they need. And um, in Japan, for some flowers, the the growers of the flowers actually hand pollinate the flowers with paint brushes. They dip mm-hmm. the paint brushes in pollen and then tap 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 and pollinate the flowers. However, it's extremely wasteful. A bunch of the pollen is over there it gets dust all over the place it uses a lot that is wasted and so researchers have been trying to figure out how they might be able to make it more efficient also the bees sometimes actually damage the flowers when they are pollinating them because like i mentioned a bit earlier bees sometimes eat the bits of the plants that they pollinate and that the process of of whatever they're doing in there sometimes leads to misformed flowers and fruits, which if you were trying to sell that flower or the fruit as food, that's not going to go very mm-hmm. far in, as far as a sale. So it reduces the ability of the farmers to be able to make money. So they're like, all right, what are we going to do? We've got the bees who hurt the flowers sometimes. And then we've also got the bees that are declining in numbers. So these Japanese researchers at, where were they? The Japanese Advanced Institute of Science and Technology um, basically got a four centimeter long toy drone to pollinate flowers. They glued horse hairs underneath the drone to make the hair, uh, make the hairs kind of, and they made them kind of sticky. Mm -hmm. And then uh, the idea was, just as on a bee, the hairs would pick up pollen from one flower and deposit it on another. But then, but then those horse hairs were damaging the flowers. And so then they went, all right, let's do something else. And the researcher was, is a father and was playing with bubbles with his young son. Said, oh, look at these bubbles. This could be the solution. <laughs> and so um, hit on this possibility and started testing in the lab bubbles blowing bubbles that had been mixed with pollen at the flowers and they found that it worked and so yes they did end up creating a a drone with a bubble maker uh, that then flew over some flowers to show that there is the possibility of drone bubble delivery to pollinate flowers this is also a solution that that the farmers could potentially take little bubble guns, like you've seen little bubble guns or little bubble blowers, and go a, go around their flowers and do it by hand if they don't want to have such a high tech solution. But bubbles. So are they like? I'm confused. <laughs> I'm trying to visualize it in my mind. So is it like? Are, so how do the bubbles pick up the pollen? So what they're doing is they're mixing the pollen with the they they have pollen already. They're not picking it up from one, okay. and taking it to another. Um, and they are, yeah, they're basically mixing pollen with the bubbles and then blowing the bubbles. Okay. And the bubbles then land on the flowers in the right place to be able to pop and drop the pollen in. That makes so much more sense because I was like, how are they getting pollen on the bubbles without popping the bubbles? And then, and then 
transporting the bubbles to someplace else and getting them right where they want them to be. I, I was that, so confused. That would be an amazing bubble skill, but I don't yeah. I don't think that's what they're doing. The yeah, they found that the bubble pollinated <laughs> fruits were just as good <laughs> as other fruits that had not been bubble pollinated. Uh, in addition, they found that this this method of bubble pollination is more efficient than the than the paint brushes than they had been using. Mm. It doesn't waste as much pollen, so it's potentially a more efficient method. Uh, the researchers are also looking into various mixes that are um, biodegradable so that right. the residue that's left on the plants after the poll pollination breaks down fairly quickly and isn't left in, or affect, to affect the plant in any way. Seems like wind can easily disrupt this process. <laughs> you know, you're not anticipating a strong breeze coming through and then every, next thing you know, your bubbles are in the wrong place. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I mean, I... I, I'd say there are maybe specific uses for bubble pollination. I mean, I'm trying to imagine the release of a large number of bubbles over an orchard. Right. <laughs> you have an industrial scale bubble <laughs> bubble blower. Listen, well, so my dog yeah. would be so upset with me if I did not buy a bubble or, or an industrial sized bubble blower because bubbles is like one of his favorite things. Right. Oh my gosh. Attack the bubbles. Right. Don't get them. Yeah. But that would have been, you know, really useful. Like when I was planting my squash and I was just like, well, how come I'm not getting any actual zucchini? What's going on? And somebody was like, well, you have to hand pollinate them. And I was just like, what? What do you mean? And so then it took me forever to get some some zucchini. But, you know, that would have been like way more. That would have been way much cooler, much more fun way to do it. It would have. Now, you know, now yeah. you can try it yourself. <laughs> I don't know if you can use just the over the counter bubble <laughs> bubble mix to pollinate your flowers, though. I'm not exactly sure of the, the mix that they were using. I said so bubble, so I'm going to try it then you know i'll have my my bubble group and my no bubble group yeah one of the concerns that people do have about uh about this methodology though is that it will distract from conserving bees so that mm -hmm. if we don't have um you know if we're not worried about the bees for pollinating more anymore we've got bubbles we don't need the bees that then right that could be that could become an environmental nightmare but, but then the other side of that is like we the bees have also like distracted from like other pollinators. And so yeah. like butterflies True. and birds and other sorts of insects that are natural pollinators for some um, plants are definitely super underlooked and understudied in comparison to bees. And so that probably would also make it worse for those groups because they're already yeah. not really looked at as much yeah. as they should be or have the credit that they should have. Yeah, that's a really good point. Yeah, maybe we should forget about the bubbles and try and just fix our ecosystems. That part. <laughs> that would be great. <laughs> Let's do that. All right. Tell me about some lizards. All lizard right. fashion so, sense. So some lizards... Um, there was a study done in Southern California looking at lizards to see if they would respond to the different clothing that people wear. So one of like the major issues with most animals and most species in the world is that they're losing their habitat and they're having a whole lot of like human encroachment and having to come into contact with humans more often. And so this could negatively impact animals like lizards because they have to spend a whole lot of energy running away from people as opposed to, you know, properly thermoregulating. So moving in and out of the sun to adjust their body temperature or finding food to eat or mates and things like that. So they're wasting a whole lot of energy on people. So this study was just like, well, maybe... The lizards would have um, a certain reaction to like the clothes that people wear because like, let me see, where is it? There is a, the species confidence hypothesis 
um, is what they were basing their study on. And so it's that hypothesis has been looked at in birds and it's like where the colors that the birds are used to. So the colors on their own bodies is what um, is gonna keep them around longer while other colors might make them run away. Hmm. So the researchers were working with um, the, uh, the Western fence lizard. And so they were like, okay, so these lizards have, you know, these blue patches on their throats and then on the sides of their bodies, they also have blue patches that are surrounded by um, black, um, dark patches, depending on the age of the lizard. And so they did like a whole bunch of what to me is super high tech um, stuff. And so they got these different t-shirts. And so they had a dark blue, a light blue, a red, and a gray. And so the dark blue and the light blue were supposed to simulate the colors that are found on the lizards. And they use these tools to look at the light frequencies of the of the blues and compare that to the light frequencies of the blue on the lizard in order to see if they were like the same wavelength um and like mm. as close together as possible and then um the gray is also like a like a secondary color that's on the lizard so the blue is what's what we think is used in like mating um for like mate choice so like the the females might look at that blue and be like oh yeah I like that real dark blue on this lizard. That's that's the lizard I want to mate with. And with the other males, it's like, oh, that lizard is it has that dark blue on it. I'm not sure if I want to challenge him to a territorial debate. I might try to go to this other lizard over here where the blue is not quite as dark. And so this one's a little younger, has less experience. I'm gonna challenge that one for their territory. And so um that's why the blue is more significant because it's already something that is giving clues to the other lizards as opposed to the gray where it's it's found on the body, but it's not giving any like um, communication cues. Um, and then the red is just a color that was super opposite um, on the light spectrum to, to the blue. And so that was supposed to be like the color that will make the lizards run away faster. So like they put on these different kinds of shirts and they found that the lizards with the the blues, they those are the ones that did not um, run away as much. Like so like they would put on the shirt and then they would start to walk towards the lizard and then the lizard would wait a longer period of time before it would run away as opposed mm. to like in the gray and the red shirts where as they approach the lizard, it'll run away faster. And then, so those lizards that didn't run away um, um, as soon as the other ones, those were the ones that were caught more often than not. And they were also the ones that were uh, less likely to run a further distance. And so when that happens, it makes it a bit easier to catch the lizards because lizards are really fast. If the lizard decides that it's gonna bolt and it runs like super far away, you're gonna have a hard time catching that lizard. And so they were, um, they also wanted to control for lizards that are used to people versus lizards that aren't used to people. And then they didn't see um, any particular uh, change there. So it was pretty much, it didn't really matter whether the lizards were used to people or not. The, the, color, the color of the shirt was really what uh, determined whether or not the lizard was going to run away or not and whether they were going to catch the lizard or not. Are you going to use this in your field work from now on? Yeah, you know, I'm going to have to get me some dark blue shirts. Luckily, my lizards also um, use the blue coloration. Sometimes they might you have like orange or green, but for the most time, it's, most of the um, time it's blue. And, you know, like I said earlier, my rule is if you see a lizard, you catch that lizard no matter what. So if you decide to wear a red shirt that day and Doesn't the lizard matter. takes off, you, you better go. take off with it. <laughs> You better start running. I think that's yeah. really interesting. I mean, I would have, you would think that red is like a, a warning color more often in nature. Mm -hmm. It's it's often kind of like a get away, run away color. So it's interesting that the gray and the red were kind of similar in that. I, right. I, would, not have, I would not have expected that result. I, I would expect the red 
they're just going to run away from regardless. Right. Well, I guess like, um, and this is just me throwing things out there here. Mm -hmm. It's just like, well, if the color is not important, unless it's the blues, then it could be literally, it might be that it's like literally any other color might send them running because that those are not the important colors to the lizards. Those aren't the colors that they really recognize. Yeah. Just anything, anything but the thing that I want. <laughs> right. Yeah. And that's a good rule to live by, you know, sometimes. Sometimes it's like you got to set up those those boundaries. <laughs> I have those boundaries. <laughs> <laughs> Try. Yeah. Yeah. I, I think that stuff like this is so, I mean, stuff that has the application, it gives you, this kind of a study is so neat because it kind of gets at the lizard behavior in nature generally, but then it also has this application to how the science is done. And right. So it has, can have this kind of feedback. And so like the idea of, of the study was like, okay, well now you can tell people like what color clothes to wear when they're going out looking for wildlife, if they want to be more likely to find it, or if they want to, you know, not be so um, disruptive to wildlife. So that way you can like go out on your hike, but then you're also not, you know, scaring everything away as you walk through even more than what you might normally do. Regardless, I'm going to scare things away. <laughs> Trump, <laughs> Trump, Trump. <laughs> right. You got to be careful, you know, where you walk, how you walk sometimes. Like sometimes you're just like in the zone and you're like, this part of the trail is like super steep and you're on the switchbacks and you don't care what is around and you're like I just got to get to the top of it and yeah. so you're just like going through it yeah <laughs> and sometimes you're tiptoeing like a ballerina right <laughs> <laughs> don't disturb the lizards yeah um uh, speaking of animals and how they perceive things there were a couple of stories that caught my eye this week that I thought were pretty interesting. The first one has to do with people, but the second one has to do with animals. And um, the, the both of them are related to beliefs and how we, how we, how we get our beliefs and how we can think of beliefs. And the first one is a study that just came out in the proceedings of the, um, Library of Science right? proceedings? No, Public Library of Science. Thank you, PLOS One. And it is a study that looked at a bunch of Australian kids compared to adults and how they how they rated whether or not something is real. And this was really kind of getting at the question of how well children understand the difference between mm -hmm. real and non-real and how that understanding develops over time. Uh, we have these traditions in Western culture, things like Santa and the Tooth Fairy. And if there are any kids listening right now, parents cover their ears. <laughs> but yeah. uh, in, in, this, in this study, researchers compared how children rated real people like the musical group the wiggles to mm -hmm. other figures like santa claus or ghosts or dinosaurs so ghosts are they're not real right they don't exist but dinosaurs we've never seen them other than their fossils so are they real were they real you know how do we how where does that that uh categorization actually actually wind up and how do we develop that belief and so they thought that they would end up with a a hierarchy between just real and unreal. That this is real, this is not real, and that kids would only have that kind of a, a delineation. Right. But in, instead, when they actually went to uh, went to look at it, it was much more complicated than that. And kids actually had a very nuanced understanding of reality much more than the authors expected them to. So they categorized um, when they asked, asked about get the kids to rate these things. Um, they ranked mostly real were dinosaurs and the wiggles, 
was great. And then um, cultural figures like Santa and the Tooth Fairy. And then there was more ambiguous figures like uh, like aliens, dragons, and ghosts. And then fictional characters that maybe they encountered through books or movies like Peter Pan or SpongeBob or Elsa. Um, and so the the kids kind of categorized into these four different delineations, these very, very nuanced categorization. And adults and older kids only had about three, real, ambiguous, and not real. And so it's interesting that children seem to have a, even more of a nuanced way of looking at that spectrum between real and not real than adults do. They haven't, I, I guess, I, I'm imagining they haven't, kids haven't crystallized it yet in their heads. Right. That's just so fascinating where it's just like, and maybe, and you know, maybe it's not even that they haven't crystallized it in their heads. It's just that, you know, adults have convinced older kids of what to think. Maybe sometimes, you know, yeah. little kids might be, you know, thinking more critically than we give them credit for. And then we tell them what is right and what is wrong. You know, I just um, mm -hmm. spent some time with my little sister. She's she just turned 11. And sometimes she would say stuff. And I was like, you know, I never really thought about that before or thought about that that way. So, yeah, kids, I'm 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 impressed, but I'm not like super surprised. I think that's right. really awesome. I think it is awesome. Um, I mean, a lot of it also does indicate like you're bringing up that the development of these ideas does depend on kind of what adults tell kids also as they're yeah. older. This is what's right. This is what's wrong. This is what's real. This is what's not real. Um, yeah. But I, I mean, the, the interesting question is, you know, when we have things in which, you know, there's a little bit of, um, I guess, acting that goes along with it, you know, putting out plates of cookies or, um, you know, putting up stockings or these other, these kind of traditions and rituals, how does that tie into the development of that understanding of how real something is? Right. Yeah. And some, and some people go so, as, so far like as to some... call that outright deception of children. I'm not going to go that far, but some people do. <laughs> I mean, I guess I could see it. But I feel like deception is something where it's like you have like negative intentions where this is more of like a fun thing. And I guess like, I don't know, I've never met anyone who was super traumatized to, you know, to to find out some things about Santa and the Easter Buddy and the Tooth Fairy. All I knew was like when I got older and put the Tooth Fairy, I was like, well, how dare you just give me a dollar then? I feel like you owe I'm owed some back pay. Like now realizing Come how on. much these are worth, you you owe me something. <laughs> yeah, then it's a conversation that you really are having with your parents. You're like, Come right. on. <laughs> I got one tooth left that's gonna fall out and I need a hundred dollars. That's good. Um and then this other study was related to animals, and I think it's so fascinating. It was just published in the journal Mind and Language, and the authors, they argue that, uh, that, that there are criteria that we should have to understand and actually investigate animal beliefs, and that, you know, they argue that animals have beliefs. And so... Um, I think that in itself is a very, a very interesting idea because I think so often we separate ourselves from the animal world um, and we navigate the world with these conceptual beliefs. If I give somebody money, they're going to give me a cup of coffee. If I, you know, there are certain things that I believe about the, the, the world works this way. If I, um, I believe that if I turn off a light switch, the light's going to go off. You know, these are these are things that have developed over time. Um, and so these these researchers have worked out their philosophers, which I think is a very interesting way to approach this idea of animal cognition. Uh, they've worked out that uh, animals need to have information about the world and be able to use it flexibly. And so they're able to take and they say here, 
This is the case when one and the same piece of information can be combined with different motivations to produce different behaviors. So if the animal can use the information that there's food available at that moment for the purpose of eating or for hiding it, that they can they can make different choices about it and behave differently in different ways. Um, and then they say also that the information has to be structured internally in a belief mm-hmm. um, and that and then that information can also be restructured, that it can be relinked. And they uh, they bring up evidence of rats lear- learning the location of food in a maze and then also being able to generally understand um, the concept of navigating a maze to be able to find food and know that if the food's not in that location, they will find it in another location. That's super interesting because like you say all this and like the first thing that pops to mind is like my dog. And so um, I've been trying to like entertain him during COVID by teaching him tricks. And so uh, the latest one is roll over. So typically if I have like a treat, he's just going to sit. But if I sit there and I hold that treat and I make him do the sit, he's going to be like, okay, she doesn't want me to do the sit. She wants me to roll over. And so then he'll just keep like rolling over until like I give him a treat. I'm like, boy, I didn't tell you to roll over. I didn't even Mm -hmm. tell you to sit, (laughs) but he's just like, so like programmed or he's just like, well, I know that if I sit, she'll give me a treat. And, and, and then he does it with other people. Like, even if it's someone he's never met before, if he sees that they have a treat in their hand, he's like, oh, this means sit. So like, I, I definitely do think that we don't give animals, um, enough credit, um, like for lizards also, like they definitely learn if I lasso a lizard, it is exponentially harder to re-catch it most of the time because they learn what the lasso is they're like oh I see you coming I see that thing coming and I am out I am not hanging around I know better this time so yeah I think that you know there there might be something something to what those researchers or what those philosophers are throwing down here yeah and I think that, that approaching it from this philosophical standpoint where you know very often in behavioral and cognitive research, it comes down to kind of mechanistic questions, you know, of, you know, say, operant conditioning or um, some habituation of some response. And so it, you know, there, there are systems and mechanics to behaviors that we've been able to kind of do cause and effect uh, investigation of, but with these criteria that they've that they've put forward in this, in this article, it kind of opens up the field to being able to look more deeply at the, the real cognition. And I think it's, you know, not, it's not beliefs in something like Santa Claus, but it is belief in the way the world works. Belief, Uh you know, having an internal state, hunger, like your dog, knowing there's a treat, that's a result somewhere. The belief that if I roll over, this is, you know, he's, your dog has learned this. It's a bit of conditioning, but there's a, there is a internal information that is involved that leads to this belief that a result is going to happen in a particular way. And it, so it, it gets to, I think, a deeper level of what's happening in an animal's mind, which is very exciting. Yeah, I totally agree. And I definitely have to add this to my Google list because I want to know more. I like this is super fascinating because I always tell people like these animals are smarter than you think they are. Like they are watching you and they are taking note. Like you need to like give them some more credit. Absolutely. Yes. (laughs) Give the animals. I mean, seriously, if we didn't have the thumbs and the big brains, I'm like, okay. Who would have been, who would have been the the next dominant animal type on the planet? Would it have been a parrot? Would it have been a corvid? Would it have been a crocodile? Who would it have been? <laughs> probably, you know, I I'm thinking it probably would have been a corvid or something like that. I get I get those vibes, or even you know, cats. It could have been cats. Cats would have been like, yeah, they're. They barely tolerate our presence. (laughs) 
as it is. If they had just that that one next step, we'd be de- dethroned. I know. Thank goodness we feed them. Feed yeah. me, human. <laughs> yeah, right meow. Uh, okay, let's dig into a couple of really quick stories. Um, I love the idea of civilizations in other parts of the universe. And people have been trying to figure out with the Drake equation and others, how many civilizations could there be in the universe? How many civilizations as advanced as ours could there have been? And a new article has just been has just come out and the authors address this question in a different way, putting new limits on the types of planets they looked at, the type of stars that they looked at. And in this article that was published in the Astrophysical Journal with their uh, weak and strong limits for Copernican life, they estimate that not in the universe, but in the Milky Way galaxy, that's just our, na- our, our galaxy, where we are, that there are probably about 36 civilizations that have come to the level of advancement that we have. And this is based on how long it got us. It took us to get to where we are, some 5 billion years. Um, And how many stars could have allowed for this? How many planets could have been in the right position to do this? We might have 36, 36 neighbors, everyone. So it's like a nice little apartment building. (laughs) <laughs> yeah, that would be super cool. Now I'm just like, well, I wonder, you know, how similar or dissimilar are they than us? And, you know, who who's going to be the first? Who's going to be the first to get to somebody else? And how long is it going to take somebody to get to us? Because I don't think that we're going to get to anybody first. Yeah, I mean, the distance, they say the, the closest one to us is probably the nearest is at most about 17,000 light years away. Um, so it's not any time soon that we would be able to communicate with them or be able to meet them unless somebody came up with some really amazing advanced technology that right. you know, involves physics that we have no clue about at this point in time. But, you know, it could, I mean, I hope that, I don't know, I don't, I don't know if I do want to meet that planet of cats. Yeah. I mean, but they might be a planet of tiny cats, like the cats you can fit in your pocket. <laughs> Little tiny pocket cats. I love exactly. it. Exactly. <laughs> the planet of mice. Yes. 36, 36 civilizations. Um, and finally, for all those scientists out there and Aaron, you know, Twitter, it is a friend to scientists. Yes. And according to a study that was published in an odd place for the study, the Annals of Thoracic Surgery. A group of researchers Mm -hmm. looked at how um, uh, specifically the thoracic surgery social media network, it's an effort of leading journals in cardiothoracic surgery. They looked at the results over a year of a randomized social media trial to determine the effect of tweeting on citations and non-traditional bibliometrics. And lo and behold, people who tweet are not surprised, but those articles that are tweeted get cited more. So yeah. if, you're, if you're a scientist, self-promote. You have to tweet your work or tell your friends to tweet your work. I saw that article on Twitter. Yes, I did. Too. <laughs> <laughs> I, I probably wouldn't have seen it otherwise, but I did see it on Twitter. Exactly. Um, and the thing about that I found absolutely Twitter is the ultimate Twitter is that there were people arguing about still after the article came out, still angry that that tweeting would affect citations in any way and upset about the fact that they would have to tweet to get well, cited you're, more. But they were already tweeting. tweeting. Yeah, <laughs> they were already <laughs> tweeting. <laughs> I mean, it's the same way as if, you know, you you called up your friends and were like, hey, you should you should read this, except for you have a bunch of friends that you never met that you were like, hey, you should read this. Yeah, it makes sense. The more people that you tell, the more people that might read it. I think I mean, that's just the way it works. And if you tell more people and you get more citations, 
potentially that will lead you to more collaborators and more funding money. So scientists, use the tools that are available to you. Yeah. Do it. <sighs> I think I've done all my stories. Do you have anything that you that you want to add that you don't think we've covered here tonight? Um, I guess the only thing that I would add is like in addition to um increasing like the number of citations you might get the some of the great things about social media is also that you get to you know build a really great community if I wasn't on Twitter I wouldn't have been a part of um black AF and STEM because yeah. I, I wouldn't have really had any way of meeting those people and you know I definitely wouldn't have met you as ha find that lizard is what got me to that triple AS conference and so like I've I've really enjoyed my you know time on Twitter and Instagram and stuff because I get to meet some awesome people like you. Well, cool, thanks. I'm glad that I got to meet you also. It's been, it's just, it's great. And I get, you know, and there is this, you know, we get to meet in person sometimes, mm -hmm. which is fantastic. Sometimes you say yes and come on my podcast and that's great. <laughs> and the rest of the time we can, we can, you know, watch each other and appreciate the work that we do on, on Twitter and, um, you know, and, and help build that good community and try and create something bigger and better and tell people about science. Yeah. So everyone out there, we have come to the end of our show. We've done it. We've made it to the end. Aaron, thank woo. you. Yes. Woo. <laughs> <laughs> thank you so much for joining me tonight on the show. Uh, it was just wonderful to get to talk to you about your lizard work. If people have questions about lizards or about AAAS and the work you're doing there or the If Then Ambassadorship, where can they find you? So I'm at Afro underscore Herper, H-E-R-P-E-R -E on Twitter, Instagram, Facebook. I also have a website, AaronMcGee.com. So I think I have all my bases covered. You should be able to find me. Fantastic. And I hope people do. Thank you once again. And I would love to shout out to people who help out the show a lot. Fada, thank you for your help with social media and show notes. Gord, thank you for manning the Twist chat room. And Identity4, thank you for recording the audio for the show. And I'd like to thank our Patreon sponsors and the Burroughs Welcome Fund for their generous support. Thank you too. Paul Disney, Andrew Swanson, Stu Pollock, Ed Dyer, Ken Hayes, Kosti Ranke, Craig Landon, Tony Steele, Alex Wilson, Steve DeBell, Joshua Fury, Philip Shane, Ed Love Science, Mark Mazaros, Richard Porters, Luke Sky, no, Sky Luke, Brian Condren, Richard, Eric Knapp, Jason Roberts, Matthew Litwin, Jack, Bob Calder, Guillaume, Dave Neighbor, E.O., Kevin Parachan, Matt Sutter, Aaron Luthen, Christopher Rappin, Brendan Minish, Greg Briggs, Robert, Gary S., Marjorie, Rudy Garcia, Kurt Larson, Steve Leesman, Sean Lamb, Greg Riley, Jim Drapo. Lisa Slazuski, Christopher Dreyer, Brian Carrington, Jason Olds, John McKee, Paul, Ardiam, Ulysses Adkins, Kevin Reardon, Noodles, Dave Wilkinson, Sue Doster, Paul Ronovich, Daryl Myshak, Dave, Dave Friedel, John Ratnaswamy, Stephen Alberon, Seth Agradney, Mountain Sloth, Rodney Lewis, Sarah Chavis, Corinne Benton, John Gridley, Gene Tellier, Patrick Pecoraro, Darwin Hannon, Matt Bass, Dan Kay, Farrah, Sarah Forfar, Donald Bundes, Howard Tan, Josiah Zayder, Taylor P.S., Ben Bignell, Maddie Perrin, Mark Hessenflow, John Atwood, Ali Coffin, Ben Rothig, John Lee, and Flying Out. Thank you for all of your support on Patreon. And if you are interested in supporting us, you can find information at patreon.com slash thisweekinscience or just click the Patreon link at twist.org. On next week's show, we're going to be talking about science on Wednesday at 8 p.m. Pacific time, broadcasting live from our YouTube and Facebook channels and from twist.org slash live. You want to listen to us as a podcast, like I've said before, search for This Week in Science wherever podcasts are found. If you enjoyed the show, get your friends to subscribe to. And for more information on anything you've heard here today, you can find links and show notes at our website, twist.org. You can also sign up for our newsletter there. You can contact us directly via email. Kirsten at thisweekinscience.com is my email. Justin is twistminion at gmail. And Blair is blairbaz at twist.org. And as Erin said, you can find her at afro underscore herper on Twitter if you want to get in touch there. You can ping 
us on Twitter as well. We're with Science, Dr. Kiki, Jacksonfly, and Blair's Menagerie. We love your feedback. And if there's a topic you would love for us to cover or address or a suggestion for an interview, please let us know. And we are going to be back here again next week. And we hope you'll join us again for more great science news. And if you learned anything from the show, remember, it's all in your head. This week in science. This week in science. This week in science. This week in science, it's the end of the world. So I'm setting up shop, got my banner unfurled. It says the scientist is in, I'm gonna sell my advice. Show them how to stop the robots with a simple device. I'll reverse global warming with a wave of my hand. And all it'll cost you is a couple of grand. Cause this week's science is coming your way. So everybody listen to what I say. I use the scientific method for all that it's worth. And I'll broadcast my opinion all over the earth. Cause it's this week in science. This week in science. This week in science. 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 This week in science. This week in science. This week in science. 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 I've got one disclaimer and it shouldn't be news. That what I say may not represent your views. But I've done the calculations and I've got a plan. If you listen to the science, you may just yet understand. That we're not trying to threaten your philosophy. We're just trying to save the world. And this week in science is coming your way. So everybody listen to everything we say. And if you use our methods instead of rolling a die, we may rid the world of toxoplasma. Got the eye. Cause it's this week in science. This week in science. This week in science. 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 This week in science. This week in science. This week in science, 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 science. I've got a laundry list of items I want to address. From stopping global hunger to dredging Loch Ness. I'm trying to promote more rational thought And I'll try to answer any question you've got So how can I ever see the changes I seek When I can only set up shop one hour a week This week in science is coming your way You better just listen to what we say And if you've learned anything from the words that we said Then please just remember it's all in your head this week in science, this week in science, this week in science, 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 this week in science, this week in science, this week in science, 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 this week in 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 science.